Hey everyone, I'm David. I'm a software engineer at Meta, and this is Adam. He's a production engineering manager at Meta. Hello. Today we're going to talk about our work together on building resilient monitoring systems at Meta. Our monitoring systems are our eyes and ears when things go wrong with our infrastructure. And we need them to be resilient, especially on those bad days, the days when infra fails and we need to get to the root cause quickly. We need our monitoring systems to be available. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Our talk is broken up into four parts. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our infrastructure at Meta and especially our monitoring infrastructure. And then we're going to talk about how we approached resiliency. We came at it from two angles. We talked, we focused on building resiliency into our culture. And then we did some technical stuff in our systems as well. And the last part is we're going to talk about how we changed what we measure and how we measure resiliency, because what you measure influences what you fix. So let's imagine a bad day, a day when one of our products is down in some part of the world, maybe many parts of the world. We get a bunch of people into a room and their job is to find out what broke and fix it as quickly as possible. And they're relying on monitoring data that's coming in from our entire ser server fleet to find the root cause. Can you imagine what, would, what that would be like if our monitoring systems would be down? We'd be flying blind. And so because of that, we know that we need our monitoring systems to always be there. So we talk about the fact that we need to be always be monitoring. So we don't have to imagine one of those bad days. We've actually had some. This one is coming from October 2021. This was my first day back in the office from the beginning of COVID. I had some meetings, came back, and I looked down the hallway and I could see all of the gizmos outside the meeting rooms go from yellow to green, which is not a great sign, but it also probably explained why, explained why my Wi-Fi wouldn't connect. So we started figuring out what's going on. I had to message my people on LinkedIn Messenger because I had no idea how else to connect with them. So we eventually got off LinkedIn Messenger, started using actual forms of communication, and figured out what we wanted to do. So the network recovered. Amazingly, a bunch of stuff just popped right back up. Our monitoring tools were just working immediately. That was awesome. Some of them didn't come back up immediately, mostly because they were overloaded. So we did some manual changes to bring them back online, either turning off load very bluntly from by turning off entire systems or by adding additional capacity and getting additional servers to run our software. After that, it was mostly just time working through backlogs, getting through the thundering herd. But it was very obvious that the thundering herd was our biggest immediate problem, and we'd never really explicitly dealt with that before. So we said, hey, we need to work on this. This is, this is the, one of the next things that we're going to work on, because next time this happens, I don't want to say, I hope it goes better than last time. But there's also, there was another question in the back of my head, which is, why didn't things just come back online? Why, some things did, some things didn't. And the short answer was like, some things are more complex than other things. So let's talk about that complexity. Why are our systems complex? Well, I'm going to give you a super high level overview of our infrastructure at Meta and our monitoring infrastructure. Now, our core infrastructure, the stuff that powers our family of apps, is built on thousands of systems running on millions of servers that are distributed around the globe. These are systems like content serving, media storage, our AI model training systems, and a massive data warehouse. All of this infrastructure needs to be monitored 24 seven. So while we've been building our core infrastructure, in parallel, we've also been building monitor monitoring infrastructure to make sure that everything's humming along nicely and we have our eyes and ears ready at all times. We've built a time series data store that stores billions of active time series. We have petabytes of structured and unstructured logs that are ingested in near real time, indexed and available, searchable by our engineers. And we have data flow tracing that blankets most of our infrastructure. So we can tell how traffic is moving from one system to the next. All of this is fed into systems for automated detection and alerting, continuous health checking so that when we push new software builds, we check how the build is progressing as it enters production. And this data is also what powers the dashboards that our on-calls rely on 24 seven to ensure that our systems are operational. And lastly, we have tools for doing, it's fed into tools for doing automated root cause investigation. Now, all of this wasn't just built at once. 
it's grown organically over time. And with that growth has come complexity built into that sort of evolution. But we're also talking about a, mon a set of monitoring for infrastructure that's really 10 or 12 different systems, each owned and operated by a different team. And that whole thing is the size of a small company. And that brings with it some cultural complexity. Yeah, these, you know, 10-ish dozen so systems, they each have their own unique team. Some of them have product managers. Some of them have TPMs. Some of them have designers. Some of them have different managers from other managers. Some of them have different VPs. So you take that piece. You also take the word very bottoms up culture. It's, this is not like a do as you're told kind of place. It's a let's do what's best for the company kind of place. So what does that mean? It means to tackle complex problems across systems, you have to work collaborati collaboratively, build consensus, and then key, avoid deadlock. So kind of with the, the backdrop of the cultural complexities and the technical complexities, what do we do? Well, we put ourselves in outage therapy. We spend a lot of time introspecting about those first few hours after the network came back. How did our systems do? How did our teams do? Now, that introspection taught us a few lessons. The recovery from any large outage is atypical, but here are a few of the things that we learned. The first is we need to be prepared for large scale failures of physical infrastructure. Networks can go away, power grids can fail, and we need to be ready for those things. We also need to be ready for overload. Adam talked about the thundering herds that we were hit with when all of our systems suddenly came back online at the same time, and thousands of engineers were also trying to figure out how healthy their systems were. And they were hitting our monitoring tools with, with lots and lots of queries, and all of that meant that we were overloaded. In fact, in those first few hours after the network came back, some of our systems saw 10 times the load they usually see a daily peak. Now, in the moment, we just threw capacity at the problem. We spun up more servers to handle the load as best we could. But adding capacity is a slow mitigation strategy. It takes time to bring servers online and put them into production. The other thing we realized is that we don't like YOLOing as our plan. We needed to be better prepared. Doing things on the fly is not a good strategy for resiliency. So what did we do? Well, we came at the problem from two different angles. First, we thought about how do we make our teams more resilient and more focused on resiliency? And how do we make our systems more resilient? We're gonna talk about some of the culture pieces first and then the technical bits. So the first thing we did was just get very clear about our identity. We are a team that manages tier zero services. Tier zero services are the core components of how we operate our company. So that's a really important, it's a big responsibility. The other thing we did is we recognize that we are the, the eyes and ears of the company, the primary sensing techniques for the entire company. So those two pieces, we said, what do we, what do we need to do? We said, okay, let's build some programs. So the first thing we did was we built a program called Always Be Monitoring, mostly because we liked the name. This is a program, a V-team, whatever you want to call it. But really, this is an execution helper. How do we go from ideas to getting things done? This is the team we did outage therapy with. We had these ideas. Let's go figure, figure out how to get them done. We figured out the way we wanted to get these things done. We had an individual take up the idea and then go do it for the first time. So how do we build our V-teams? Really, what we wanted to do is build a, have a really good representation of the different products in our space. We want to have a really good representation for the types of solutions we could do in our space. But we also wanted to keep the team relatively small so we could still move fast, because that's really important. We came up with a bunch of really great ideas, a couple of less great ideas, and we prioritized what we wanted to do. We chose, we obviously just chose the lower effort, highest impact results, and low risk. And then within each V team, how do we get this done? We designated somebody, we, we're calling them that kind of retcon as a trailblazer, that's not a term we used at the time, but somebody would go out and go do the first version of this whether it was DR or overload protection. And then they would kind of keep in the back of their mind that, oh yeah, I'm going to help the rest of the teams do this. And then so they'd finish their project. They'd come back and say, hey, here's what I did. And here's what I think we should do. And then help each individual team go do that. So what did we actually do? 
I'm going to talk about two of the most important things that we focused on. The first is disaster preparedness. Now, the 2021 outage taught us that we need to be prepared for the failure of our physical infrastructure. We also look back at some of the side events, the things that had affected our systems before, and learned that we also need to be prepared for failures in our software dependencies. So with all of that in mind, we decided to focus first on how we dealt with physical dependency failure. What happens when the network goes away or power goes away? Well, we got all our teams together and we thought about how we would tackle this problem. The first thing we did was we established shared expectations. We said each service should be able to sustain the loss of its largest region without violating its SLO. If your largest data center goes away, your users shouldn't even know. Once we had that expectation in place, we, the rest was easy. We went about sizing and load testing our services to figure out, well, do, could we actually tolerate the loss of our largest data center? In cases where that, the answer came back as no, we added capacity. We provisioned disaster readiness buffers till we got to a point where we felt like we were ready for that situation. And then we decided to hold ourselves accountable by just taking away capacity one day every month. Facebook's got great tools for doing this kind of thing. We have tools like Belljar and Shard Manager that allow us to simulate region failure or network cuts without actually taking down the network. And so we committed to doing that on a monthly basis. And we do. And for the most part, our users never even know. The second thing we focused on was overload. Now, Meta is a bit special here. We have an open ecosystem where tens of thousands of engineers are accessing internal APIs and making calls from one system to another. This can bring some surprises with it. Sometimes there are thundering herds because an engineer might decide to do something like restart 100,000 servers all at once. Sometimes they really need to do that, but it has side effects. In other cases, with multi-tenant systems, we have noisy neighbors. Maybe someone's trying an experiment and that has an adverse effect in a shared system. There are also new product launches and viral events, things like New Year's Eve and the FIFA World Cup that can really bring surges of traffic with them. So we understood that we needed to be prepared for overload, but really also extreme overload, the kind of overload we saw in the recovery from the 2021 outage. I mentioned we saw 10 times some of our daily peaks there. So how did we prepare for that? Well, the recipe was pretty similar. We started by establishing shared expectations. Each service cannot melt down under overload. Instead, we have to be able to do load shedding, shed non-critical workloads so we can keep the service operational. In order to do that, we needed our services to be able to assign criticality scores to incoming traffic. And so each service set about, set about thinking how to do that. Once you've got that in place, the rest is easy. You can build knobs that allow you to shed traffic with lower criticality scores, and that can get you to a point where you have a healthy amount of load in the system if you do get hit with a thundering herd. We decided to keep ourselves accountable again, so every three months, we do load shedding exercises where we purposefully, in production, drop a certain percentage of non-critical traffic so that we can verify that we're able to save resources like CPU, memory, and I.O. The last bit I'm going to talk about is a bit of technology that we built that helped to influence our culture. We talked about the fact that we have multiple different teams and that they each own and operate their little part of the world and they do a really good job at it. But how do we get them to think about the system as a whole? If you think about something like getting an alert for high CPU utilization, what does that entail? Well, it means you have to have CPU utilization data that's being ingested into a time series data store. That data has to be available through a query engine. There's gotta be a monitoring system, a detection system that is executing that query periodically, fetching the latest data, comparing it to thresholds for a healthy system. When it finds an unhealthy system, it's got to generate an alert with the details of what the utilization was and when it happened. And then that alert has to be routed to an engineer who gets notified. They get a phone call or an SMS that says, hey, something's broken. If you think about that workflow from start to finish, it crosses five or six different systems and we need them all to work together. If any one of them fails, the whole thing is broken. So we started thinking about how we could measure resiliency on those end-to-end -end workflows. And we built a system called MonMon. It stands for Monitoring the Monitoring Systems. Do you get it? MonMon's really simple. It's a binary that continuously runs black box tests. Each of those tests simulates one of those end-to-end -end workflows, just like the high CPU utilization alert that I mentioned. And then we publish, we publish metrics that tell us how well the system is working from start to finish. And then we put those metrics in front of our engineers. And that got them thinking about the system at a higher level and got them thinking about 
how the system worked as a whole. By changing the way we measured, we were able to change the perspective of our on-calls. So we got these really awesome gains from doing the disaster recovery work, from doing the overload protection work. So how do we maintain those gains? Stay swole, if you will. So we started this program, we call it the Monitoring Overviewers, and really it's, again, like a v, it's another V-team, but it's their job is to step back from their day-to-day team-based operations, and once a week, say, we have one person every week, say, what's going on across all of the systems? Let me look to see what each system, let's see what this Monmon is doing. So this is a case where, it's on the previous slide, but it says, this really affected, or this, uh, this influences the culture, and Monmon directly influences the culture and directly influences the overviewers. There's this really awesome virtuous cycle between the overviewers and the and Monmon. And if when we originally built Monmon, if you told me that this was actually going to change the culture of the team, I would have been like, yeah, sure, whatever, let's move on. But I even today, I'm still surprised how effective it's been. So we got our gains, we got a way to sustain them. What are we gonna do next? Well, the cool part for us is we're going to take the overviewers and kind of just plus plus it, right? We're going to make the higher viewers. We're going to give people dedicated time to actually do the overviewer work and then also feedback and do more Mon Mon stuff, add more tests, do more investigations across the stack. How can we do everything better across the whole stack? What are we going to do on the technical front? Well, at Meta, we like to say that the journey is 1% complete. This is a way that we keep ourselves humble. Even though we're a large company, there's a lot that we don't know and a lot that we're still learning. And at this scale, we expect systems to fail in unexpected ways. The 2022 energy crisis in Europe and heat waves across the United States taught us that we need to think beyond the failure of a single data center. And we need to think about what happens if multiple data centers go away at the same time. We need to spend more time thinking about how we deal with the failures of our low-level dependencies, the storage systems that we rely on to store our time series data. And we need better ways to distinguish critical from non-critical workloads. We've got what I would call a first-order approximation, and we need to refine that. But the really cool part is that we've got the cultural resiliency built into our organization, and we've made some progress on our first set of goals. So we're really set up to go after this next round of things. So with that, we'll end. Thank you for listening, and we'd love to hear your questions.